afternoon, everyone, and welcome to All Prophecy Fulfilled dot com on the World Wide Web and on Facebook and of course YouTube. Simply All Prophecy Fulfilled. Okay, we are going to do another Ask Your Pastor segment. This is part two. Last segment was part one. So if you haven't watched that, you might want to go watch that first. Answer that question or have your pastor answer that question before coming to this. I've labeled this the uh, New Heavenly Jerusalem from above. Now, what I did in that last video, just a quick recap, is I basically took three passages, uh, kind of like columns, one, two, three. Galatians chapter four, which is the Jerusalem above. Hebrews chapter 12, the heavenly Jerusalem, and Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem. And what I did is I demonstrated that in each one of these passages, each contained the same descriptive elements within the passage itself or within the immediate context. In other words, every passage showed or contained a Jerusalem and associated with that the new covenant, the church, a kingdom, and a new creation. Okay, so my question was really simple. Are these three Jerusalems really just one in the same? And I would contend, yeah, I think, you know, the testimony of Scripture with Scripture clearly shows that. And I think you, you see that, too. In fact, I even got uh, some, some comments back saying, you know, who says they don't? Or who, or who says, yeah, they're not? Uh, as if to imply, well, yeah, no, duh. You know, but, you know, it's funny. I have looked at a handful of commentaries. And I tell you what, man, there is a, a notable uh, silence or maybe an absence in referencing or associating the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 with the other two. Now, why do you think this is? Well, I think that's because this, that's a scary proposition to the futurist eschatology because they see the clear uh, time references in each text as to when these Jerusalems would arrive. In other words, if the Christians had already come to the heavenly Jerusalem in Hebrews chapter 12 and the Jerusalem above in Galatians chapter 4, well, then they had already come to the new Jerusalem of Revelation 21. And we can't really have that because we know that's future to us, right? Well, hold on a second. Don't, don't lose me here. Uh, let, me, let me do this. Uh, before uh, I get to the Ask Your Pastor question. I am going to quickly cover these three Jerusalems again, but this time I'm actually going to make note of what the New Testament writers actually say regarding the timing of these Jerusalems. And if you're being honest with yourself, and if you're being objective, uh, and if you really want to open up your Bible and check these with you know these scripture references, do so because you just might find this to be a paradigm buster for you. So here we go. Let's look at our, our, our first column, Galatians chapter 4. So in Galatians chapter 4, Paul is describing two different covenants. It's a contrast of covenants. You have the Jerusalem that now is in Paul's day. That's the covenant of Moses. You have the Jerusalem above, which is uh, the covenant of Messiah in Christ. So for a period of about 40 years, uh, two different covenants coexisted after Jesus came and inaugurated, if you will, the new covenant in his blood. So in verse 29, Paul makes it clear that those in the Mosaic covenant were persecuting those who had entered into covenant of Messiah, just like back with Ishmael and Isaac. There was persecution going on here. But in verse 30, he says one of these covenants and those in it uh, would have to go. Uh, which one would have to be cast out? Well, that would be the bondwoman who was associated with the old or the Mosaic covenant. Now, here's the question that uh, I swear is it's just it's so often ignored. I don't I don't see anybody dealing with this. When would the bondwoman and her children be cast out? This is a matter of timing. Well, you know what? I think Jesus speaks directly to this in his parables in Matthew 21 and 22. Let's take a look. Okay, so in Matthew 21 and 22, Jesus gives two parables side by side, right in a row here. 
And for time constraints, the nature of these videos, I'm really going to condense this down. In chapter 21, he gives the parable of the vine dresser. So you got a landowner planting a, a vineyard. He leases it to vine dressers. He goes into a far country. He sends his servants to collect the fruit of it. Well, what do the vine dressers do? Well, they, they continually beat and kill the servants that he continues to send. Last of all, last of all, that's important. He sends his son saying, well, they'll listen to him. Well, they didn't listen to him. What did they do? Well, they did the exact same thing thing they killed the son they said this is the heir let us seize him and take his inheritance so how does jesus summarize or bring to conclusion this particular parable well in verse 43 he says therefore i say to you the kingdom of god will be taken from you and given to another nation or people bearing the fruits of it and then immediately in chapter 22, he goes into another parable. And by the way, those listening knew he was speaking of those associated with the Old Covenant or Mosaic Covenant because it says in verse 45, the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables and they perceived that he was speaking of them. So in 22, he goes on to give a parable of the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And just like that first parable, he sends his servants out and he called those who were invited to the wedding. But you know what? They weren't willing to come. So uh, he continues to send his servants uh, to invite people to the wedding. They make light of it. They seize his servants. And what do they do? They kill his servants. Well, the king is is furious and so what does he do well in verse 7 he sends out his armies he destroys those murderers and he burned up their city wow and then he says the wedding is ready so he goes out and he invites more into the wedding which is now ready as the city has been burned up but some of those who came were not w wearing the proper wedding attire. They did not have a wedding garment. So what does he say to those? He says, uh, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is so important. And I know that was a lot to take in. But he, when would the kingdom be taken from old covenant Israel and given to another people? when the city was destroyed. This gives us the timing of the things related to the Jerusalem in Galatians chapter four, the Jerusalem above. And by the way, do you see what happens at this time? There is a wedding. I mean, this is thematic in Paul's theology. He is continually talking about this impending wedding. He wants to present the church as a chaste virgin to Christ when at his coming. So the wedding correlates with Christ's coming. And this wedding happens when they are cast out. When does that happen? When the city is destroyed. Folks, this really can be no other time than in AD 70 when the old covenant system and the temple along with it was destroyed. The city was burned up. Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, our second column. That's the heavenly Jerusalem. And remember, we have the same uh, descriptive elements, if you will. You have the uh, heavenly Jerusalem you associated with a new covenant, with the church, a kingdom, and a new creation. Well, what does the text tell us regarding the timing as far as when this new or this heavenly Jerusalem would arrive. Well, let's go there. Hebrews chapter uh, 12, 22. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. They, he says, you have come. That's a, a present indicative, uh, active tense meaning uh, this was in their day folks they had come to it now i want you to think big picture here think context here think covenantally here you have the old and the the, the new you have the old covenantal uh, nighttime or the darkness that's associated with that old covenant that was becoming obsolete it was passing away that's hebrews chapter 8. Uh, in fact, didn't John say in 1 John 2 that the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining? 
Now, when would the darkness finally give way to the light? That would be when the old system finally and ultimately was taken out of the way and it was cast out. Sounds like Galatians chapter 4 this, with the destruction of the city. Well, then you have this new covenant breaking in. It's like the sun was, was rising. It was getting brighter. It was almost daytime. Doesn't Paul in, in Romans chapter 13, he says, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, for your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And then he says this. This is awesome. He says, The night is nearly over. The day has drawn near. So what did the Hebrews writer tell them to do or tell them to do about it? Well, just a little bit later in chapter 13 and 13 and 14, listen to this. He says, therefore, go, let us go forth to him outside the camp. That's where Christ was crucified, bearing his reproach. For here, where's the here? That's the, that's the, the physical city of Jerusalem. He says, here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one about to come. And yes, I did say about to come. That may not be in your in your particular translation, but that's the word. It's from mellow. And it means it's on the cusp of, it's impending, it's imminent, it's about to happen. Now it's interesting because they see him, seem to have come right up to it. Um, you know, as, as if they're going forth outside the camp to look for that heavenly Jerusalem that was about to come down to them in their lifetime, in their day. So I, I hope you can see and, and feel the imminence of this particular passage. Now, let's take a look at our third Jerusalem. That's the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22. So in the new Jerusalem of Revelation 21, uh, we have, just like the other Jerusalems, we have the exact same uh, descriptive elements, okay? We have a uh, Jerusalem. We have a new covenant associated with it. We have a bride or a church. We have a kingdom, and we have a new creation. Okay, then, what about the timing of this particular Jerusalem? Now, look, I'm going to make this just short, sweet, and simple as I possibly can here. Uh, if we can't trust the explicit, clear time statements uh, within the book of Revelation itself, I don't know what we can trust because it is, it is so clear. In chapter 1, verse 1, right off the bat, he says he is showing his servants things which must shortly take place. And then in verse 3, he says the time is near. And if that's not good enough for you, which it should be, it, he reiterates his point way at the other end of the book. At the end, he says the same thing. He's showing his servants things which must shortly take place. And then he goes on to say, behold, surely I am coming quickly. Now look, it's as if he's, he's bookending this entire revelation uh, to demonstrate that all these events are happening within this time frame, which would be soon, shortly. It was right around the corner. Folks, this new Jerusalem was coming soon. Let's move on. Okay, we have dealt with three specific Jerusalem passages and what the Bible actually says about the timing of these Jerusalems, or this Jerusalem, rather. Okay, so in Revelation 21, 2, I mentioned the New Jerusalem. Well, let's go back one verse to verse 1. Here's how the chapter begins. He says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This is so important. I don't know if you see this, but whatever the new Jerusalem is, or whatever the heavenly Jerusalem is, whatever the uh, Jerusalem above is, whatever these three uh, synonymous Jerusalems are, they clearly come down when this new heavens and new earth arrive, or in conjunction with the entrance of the new heavens and the new earth. Do you see that? Now, this is important because you're probably saying, well, uh, oh, okay, well, Revelation 21 to 22 is future, so that has to be something future, right? Wrong. Now, pay attention here, because this is really important. What new heavens and earth is he talking about here? 
Where do we see that? How about elsewhere in the New Testament? Let's start with that. Well, you might say, well, 2 Peter chapter 3. Correct mundo. You're right there. But Peter says back in his day that they were anticipating, they were looking forward and hastening this day. They were eagerly anticipating it. He even said that the, the new heavens and the new earth were according to his promise. Whose promise? God's promise. Well, where do we see this? Well, we see it in the Old Testament. Where do we see this in the Old Testament? The promise of a new heavens and a new earth. Do you know? Well, if you guessed Isaiah chapter 65, you guessed correctly. Okay, you get extra credit on that. Now, this is the only place in the Old Testament that you're going to find reference to a promised new heavens and new earth. Now, do you think it might behoove us <laughs> to know what Isaiah was talking about there if you want to know what Peter was talking about here? Because Peter really gets his theology from the Old Testament scriptures. What does Isaiah say about the timing? Do you think it might line up with the timing we see in Galatians, in Hebrews, in Revelation? Do you think it might agree with what Jesus said in his parables? Yeah, it does. Watch this. Okay, so we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 65. Now, here's the question. When exactly would this new heavens and new earth, the new creation that Isaiah promised, that Peter reminded his audience that was actually about to come, when would this actually break forth, break in? Well, we see it around the middle of the chapter, right around chapter 65, chapter 65 verse 17. But here's the question. What leads up to it? it? You know, this is so often ignored. This is, it's, it's amazing, really. Uh, there is this progression of events, or better yet, I would describe it as a relational progression, or maybe better yet, a relational regression. It's a relational or covenantal deterioration between God and his covenant people. And that happens until something happens. Judgment. That's always the order of things. There is a deterioration in the relation between God and his covenant people because of their disobedience. And then finally, judgment. And with the final judgment would come something new. Now watch this. Uh, chapter 65, verse 2, he says, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, according to their own thoughts. A people who provoke me to ang anger continually to my face. Verse 6 and 7, I will not keep silent, but will repay, even repay to their bosom your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together. Therefore, I will measure their former work in their bosom. Verse 11, you are those who forsake the Lord, who forgot my holy mountain. Therefore, I will number you with for the sword and you shall all bow down to the slaughter because when I called you, you did not answer. When I spoke, you didn't hear. Verse 15, he says, for the Lord your God will slay you and call his servants by another name. And then we have in verse 17, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. So my question again is, when would this new heavens, this new earth be created? When would it come in? Well, verse two, it would come after God has stretched out his hands all day long to a rebellious people, his old covenant people. Verse 6 and 7, it would come when God would no longer keep silent, but he would repay his unfaithful people for their iniquities, along with the iniquities of their father uh, before them. Man, that sounds like uh, Matthew 23, doesn't that? Filling up the, the measure of their father's guilt, cup of wrath type of thing. It would be uh, verse 12. Uh, it, it would coincide with God numbering his people for the sword when they uh, would bow down to the slaughter. Why? Because when I called you, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear. That sounds like uh, Matthew 22, doesn't it? They were invited, but they weren't willing to come. 
Verse 15, rather, he says uh, it, it would be when God finally slayed them and then called his servants, that is, you know, those who actually sought him and came to him, that's verse 10, uh, by another name. So he cast them out, as Paul said he would in Galatians chapter 4. All these things, all these things, and then the new creation, and then the entrance of the new heavens. And then, in verse 17, he says, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Listen to this. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, for behold, what's he creating? He's creating a Jerusalem, a rejoicing. Wow. There it is, folks, the Jerusalem rejoicing. That's the Jerusalem of Galatians 4, Hebrews 12, Revelation 21. That, you know, uh, Jerusalem rejoicing. That reminds me so much of uh, Psalm 102. David is talking to a generation yet to come. He says that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. What people? God's new covenant people. Look, I know that was a lot to absorb at one time. It, all that to say that the Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the new Jerusalem, yes, they are in fact one and the same. And as such, we must accept the fact that Scripture teaches that the timing of these Jerusalems, or this Jerusalem, is in fact one and the same. And that Scripture teaches that this Jerusalem is not a future uh, reality that we're looking forward to, a future event. This is a present reality. If indeed you are in Christ, you have come into this new Jerusalem, into this city. And this particular city, this new Jerusalem, it's not a physical city. It is a spiritual reality. It is a covenantal habitation or reality or relationship that you have come into and you are a part of. And this entered in along with the entrance of the new heavens and the new earth. This is the testimony of Scripture. And we must allow the teaching of Scripture, the timing, what Scripture teaches about the timing of these things to, to be a framework in which we interpret uh, our Scripture from. Okay, so what is my Ask Your Pastor question? Okay, well, last week I asked the question, are these three Jerusalems in fact one and the same? I say yes, most people do. However, if your pastor or you say, nope, they're not the same Jerusalem, okay, then I would simply ask that you demonstrate uh, with Scripture how they're not. Because I think I've clearly demonstrated that they are. Now, if you concede or if your pastor says, yeah, uh, they are in fact the same Jerusalem, well, then here's the question. If that's the case, how can the New Jerusalem uh, of Revelation 21, which comes with the uh, new creation, the entrance of the new heavens and the new earth, how can that be a yet future event that we're still waiting for? When in fact, Scripture says no. That is actually the Jerusalem above. That's actually the heavenly Jerusalem, which clearly comes as Isaiah teaches. And even Jesus in his parables would come with judgment and the destruction of the city, Jerusalem. That's it. That's my question. So... I've gone on too far, too long. Sorry about that, folks, but that was a lot of information. So uh, appreciate you getting back to me uh, with an answer. I really do. So that's about it for now. Got to run. We'll see you uh, the next go-round. Take care. Bye-bye.